you're probably here for one of two reasons. Either you're an undergraduate college student in an introductory level philosophy course with me, and before we jump into the actual content of the course, we need to talk about what philosophy is. Or you're the parent of a college student, and that college student just took an introductory level course, maybe with me, and then they came home and said to you that they're thinking about majoring in philosophy. And you're like, uh, is that a good idea? But they knew that you were going to say that, so they came to my office hours beforehand and they said, hey, I'm really interested in majoring in philosophy, and I don't know if my parents are going to like the idea. And I said to them, well, that's probably because, like most people, they don't really know what academic philosophy is. So here's the link to a video that you should send them to explain what philosophy is, and this is that video. Before we start, we need to address the fact that philosophy is a word in the English language that people use in all sorts of weird ways. And the thing that we're talking about here is academic philosophy, the kind of thing that you would encounter in a college level philosophy class. So before we start, take all of the associations that you have with the word philosophy, whatever comes to mind when you hear that word, and just throw it out. We're going to start with a blank slate. Any time that a college philosophy professor tells you that he or she is going to explain what philosophy is, the next thing that happens is they tell you about the etymology of the word. The word philosophy comes from Greek. It comes from two words. The first word is philia, which is one of the Greek words for love. And the second word is sophia, which is a Greek word meaning wisdom. So literally, philosophy is the love of wisdom. This, however, is entirely useless if we want to know what philosophy, the modern academic subject, is. First, it's useless because, well, love is an emotion, and it's certainly not the kind of emotion that we're dealing with in the classroom. What we do in the classroom isn't so much the love of wisdom, but the pursuit of wisdom, or something like that. Okay, so you might replace love with pursuit and then say that philosophy is the pursuit of wisdom. But that's not going to work either because every academic subject is the pursuit of wisdom. Physics is the pursuit of wisdom about the motion of really small fundamental particles. And biology is the pursuit of wisdom about the nature of organisms. And history is the pursuit of wisdom about stuff that happened already. So the etymology isn't going to help. So let's just start with some examples. Examples of the kinds of questions that philosophers talk about. Here's one. Does God exist? You know God. All-knowing, all-powerful, perfectly benevolent creature that created the entire universe in which we live, or so they say, right? The question is, is there a creature like that? Or another question, how do I know I'm not dreaming right now? You know dreams? Dreams are like when you're on a pirate ship, but it's also a dragon, and then later, that other dragon is now your grandma, but it didn't like turn into your grandma, it just now is your grandma. That's a dream. And when you're dreaming, you think you're living. And so the question is, well, how do I know that I'm not dreaming right now? How do I know that all of my experiences aren't fictional in some way? Do I have free will? Which actions are morally good and which actions are morally bad? What is the just way to arrange society? Is that how you spell arrange? I don't know. And 
When I say just, I mean fair, right? What is the fair way to arrange society? Does life have a meaning or a purpose? Do I have a soul that lives on after my bodily death? Okay, so these are some philosophical questions. And these questions or questions like these occur to lots of people. They occur to children. They occur to stoners. Here's the thing about children. Questions like this very often occur to children, and children are interested in them. And then children stop thinking about them. What happens? Well, here's what doesn't happen. It's not like these children continue to think about these questions, and they come to well-supported, reasoned, rational answers to these questions, and then they move on. That's not what happens. Instead, the children grow up, and they get busy and distracted by other things, by dating and taxes or whatever. And then they just sort of put these questions to the back of their mind, or they put them out of their mind altogether, and they just stop thinking about them. Philosophers don't stop thinking about them. At least, they don't stop thinking about these questions until they have real, rigorous, serious, well-thought-out, rationally supported answers to these questions. And I mean, that sort of gets at the big difference between philosophers and the stoners. Unlike stoners, philosophers are trying to answer these questions rigorously. What do I mean by rigorously? Think about this. Say you wanted to know which star in the sky was the brightest star. One way you could try to answer that question is by going outside and looking at the stars. And you'd look at the different stars and you'd see which ones look brighter. And, you know, you'd look at one of them and then you'd look back at the other and back and forth. And then maybe if you were even more serious about it, you'd bring out a friend and have them look. And you'd talk about which stars looked brighter. But an astronomer that wants to know which star is the brightest star, they use all sorts of careful, precise brightness measuring devices. And they monitor every star on multiple nights, just in case there's a very faint cloud that's slightly blocking one of the stars, making it seem dimmer than it really is. And then when they get really serious about it, the astronomers launch a satellite into space to look at the stars and how bright they are from outside of the clouds, right, outside of the Earth's atmosphere. The astronomers are trying to answer these questions rigorously, seriously. That's what philosophers are doing with these questions. They're not just idly thinking about them, they're taking them extremely seriously and trying to answer them rationally. There's also another group of people who think about questions like these, and those are priests or religious leaders, religious people. These are religion-y questions, at least some of them are. So you might be wondering, what's the difference between a religious leader who also thinks about these questions and a, an academic philosopher? Well, there are two differences that I can think of. One of the differences is that religious leaders attempt to answer at least some of these questions via revelation. Revelation is when someone tells you the answer. So take, for example, which actions are morally good or bad? One way to get the answer to that question is for someone who already knows the answer to just reveal it to you, to just tell you the answer. That is at least a primary method for answering that question uh, for religious leaders. Philosophers, by contrast, they, the only tool that they have is reason, is just thinking very, very clearly about all of the surrounding issues and answering this question rationally, just with their brains, not by having the answer revealed to them by someone else. Now, I should mention that a lot of famous religious leaders or religious people have also been philosophers. St. Thomas Aquinas, uh, he was a Catholic Dominican monk. Um, anyway, he was also a philosopher. He believed that the revealed truths in the Bible were indeed truths, 
but he also attempted to use arguments and reason to answer questions like these. He famously gave several arguments attempting to prove the existence of God. And if you're watching this video because you're in a course with me, depending on what course it is, we may talk about several of those arguments. The other difference between religious leaders and philosophers is that religious leaders have a predetermined answer to several of these questions, whereas philosophers don't. You could go either way on any of these questions and still be a philosopher if you're trying to answer that question seriously and rigorously. If you conclude that God exists based on some serious, rigorous arguments, then you're doing philosophy. And if you conclude that God doesn't exist based on some serious, rigorous arguments, then you're doing philosophy. But if you give certain answers to certain questions here, then you stop being a priest or a religious person anymore. Okay, so when I was an undergraduate, all I got were examples. That is, if you want to know what philosophy is, then one way is to just give a list of philosophical questions and say that philosophy is the enterprise of rigorously, seriously, rationally answering those questions. And that's all I got as an undergraduate. But there is something better. We could maybe get an explanation of why these questions are philosophical questions. And that's what I want to try to do right now. Okay, so look at this list of questions. What do they all have in common that makes them philosophical questions? When I ask that to a group of college students, one of the first answers that I always get is something like this. All of these questions are in some sense subjective. And what that usually means is something like, there's no right answer that's right for everyone everywhere. Everyone has their own answer, and everyone is right when they answer the question the way they feel they should answer it. Something like that. Now, there are some questions that are genuinely subjective. Like, take the question, are pickles tasty? It seems to me like the tastiness or not tastiness of pickles is a subjective matter. Some people like pickles. They say pickles are tasty. Other people don't like pickles. They say pickles are disgusting. Everyone's right. When the pickle lovers say that pickles are great, they're right. And when the pickle haters say that pickles are terrible, they're right too. Everybody's right because matters of taste are subjective. So is the subjectivity of these questions the thing that makes them philosophical? No. It can't be because it seems to me that none of these questions are subjective. Not one of them. Look at them. We've already been talking about, does God exist? That's just a question about whether something exists. Say you want to know whether Bigfoot exists. Well, that's a creature, a kind of being. Is there such a thing? Either there is or there isn't. Some people think that Bigfoot exists. Some people think not. Well. One of those groups is wrong. There either is or isn't a creature like that. And the same is true for whether or not God exists. Either this creature, this being, this entity exists or not. It's not a subjective matter, it's, it's an objective matter. Or, for example, do I have a soul that lives on after my bodily death? That's just a question about what's going to happen in the future what kind of creature you are, and what's going to happen when your body dies. Look, your body is either going to die and you're going to cease to exist, or your body is going to die and you're going to keep living somewhere else. It's an objective matter. One of those two things is going to happen. It's not like the answer is different for different people based on their opinion. The other thing I want to mention is that we shouldn't think that because there is disagreement, about some matter or the answer to some question, that therefore the question is subjective. There's disagreement about whether the Earth is round or flat. 
I mean, there are very few people who think it's flat. And they have all sorts of kooky theories and bad arguments, and they're wrong. But there's disagreement, and one side is wrong. Well, there's disagreement about these two. That doesn't mean that one side isn't right and one side isn't wrong. OK, here's another answer that I often get when I ask students, what do all these questions have in common that makes them philosophical questions? I'm often told that these questions are deep. They're deep, big, important questions. I don't think that that's going to help us identify what philosophy is either, because there are lots of big, important, deep questions that aren't philosophical, that aren't studied by academic philosophers who have jobs at colleges and universities. Like, here's an example. Will the universe keep expanding forever? You know that the universe is expanding? All of the galaxies are moving farther and farther apart from each other. And not only that, but the expansion is accelerating. That is, they're more quickly moving apart from one another than they were, well, any, at any time in the past. So the universe is expanding. Is it going to keep expanding forever? Whew. That's a deep question, or a big, important, fundamental question. But it's not a philosophical question. It's not the kind of question that philosophers answer or attempt to answer in the philosophy classroom. This is a, an astronomical question, or an astrophysical question. Here's another deep question. Where did life come from? How did it come to be the case that there are living creatures on this planet? That's a big, deep, significant, grand question. But it's not a philosophical question. It's not the question that a philosopher has any special expertise in answering. It's a biological question or a question of evolutionary biology. So deepness isn't going to tell us what's distinctive about philosophical questions. But right now, I am going to tell you what is distinctive about philosophical questions. Okay, so let's say you want to know whether a question is philosophical or not. The first thing you need to ask about that question is this. Can it be answered with observation or experimentation, or primarily or fundamentally with observation or experimentation? Take, for example, the question, what gives physical objects their mass? That's a question in physics, and the answer is the boson. Right? You guys know about the boson? Bosons. Uh, we discovered bosons, I think. They're particles, and they're the ones that give every object mass. They're very, very small. I don't really know the details, but I know that the way that they discovered the existence of the boson was, at some level, by shooting particles really, really fast into stuff and looking at what happens. Those are experiments. So the question, what gives objects their mass, is a question that can be answered by observation or experimentation. The answer in this case is yes. If the answer to this question is yes, then that question is what we would call an empirical question. Empirical. You don't have to remember that word. Another example of an empirical question is is this. Here, this is a real question for you to answer. Chickens. Do chickens lay eggs or do they give birth to live young? They lay eggs. How do we know? How did we answer that question? I'll tell you how we did it. By looking. We looked at the chickens. We observed them. We watched them. And we watched the babies fall out. And they weren't babies, they were just eggs. And then the eggs, they got to sit on the eggs, and then the eggs hatch. That's how chickens uh, give birth. So that's an empirical question also. If the question that you're asking can be answered in this way, then it is, well, a certain kind of scientific or historical question. It's an empirical question. So here we've got physical questions that you encounter in physics. 
We've got historical questions that you encounter in history. All of the questions about what happened in the past are answered by observing things, by looking at documents and fossils and records and that sort of thing. Biology, that was the chicken example. That goes there as well. But not all questions can be answered by observation or experimentation. Let me give you an example of a non-empirical question, a question that can't be answered by observation or experimentation. Is the number nine a prime number? Okay, answer that question. Is nine prime? Prime numbers are numbers that can be only evenly divided by themselves in one. The answer is no. Nine is not a prime number. How did we figure that out? Did we figure it out by observing the number nine or by experimenting on it? No, we definitely didn't. And here's how I know we didn't. That's because this is not, strictly speaking, the number nine. This, right here, this is some ink in the shape of a numeral. A numeral is a symbol that represents the number itself. And then there's another numeral for nine. Here's another one you may have seen. It looks uh, like this, right? That's the Roman numeral, and this is the Arabic numeral. These are different ways of writing the same thing, and that thing that these different symbols represent is the number nine. The question, is nine a prime number, is not a question about this symbol. We don't answer that question by like chopping up the symbol into three parts and seeing if we can evenly chop it up into three parts. That's not the question. We weren't interested in dividing the symbol, the numeral. We were interested in dividing the number. And, well, the number nine, you've never seen it. So you couldn't have possibly observed it. And you can't capture it and shoot it out of a, a particle accelerator or trap it in a cage and make it go through a maze like a mouse or something. You can't run experiments on the number nine because the number nine isn't the kind of thing that you can look at or grab. So however it is that we discovered the fact, and it's a real fact, we didn't just make this up, it's a real fact, the number nine is not prime. However we discovered that fact, it wasn't by observation or experimentation. Let me make this point again, but not with numbers. Let's go with this. Okay, now be your most pedantic. Be your most literal when you're answering this question that I'm about to ask. What is that? Okay, it's not a triangle. This is just some ink on a piece of glass. It's like a special piece of glass. But this is just some ink on a piece of glass. A triangle is a two-dimensional, three-sided polygon. And, well, as a two-dimensional object, you know, it doesn't exist. There are no triangles. Not in our world, not in our universe, because everything in our universe is three-dimensional. Look around. Where are you? Are you sitting in your aunt's house right now? Look at everything. There's a lamp, three dimensions. There's a tree outside, made of three dimensions. You, your face, three-dimensional. It's got a height and a width and a depth. Everything you've ever seen in your whole life has had three dimensions. You've never seen a triangle because triangles don't exist. Or they don't exist in our world, there aren't any around. This is a bunch of ink, and the ink is made of molecules, and those molecules, although they're very small, are three-dimensional, right? There is some depth here. This is just a drawing that represents a triangle. And when we ask a question about a triangle, like, what is the sum of the interior angles? of a triangle. When we ask a question like that, we're not asking a question about this drawing. We're asking a question about a triangle, a real triangle. And how do we figure that out? Well, I'll tell you how we figure it out. We figure it out by way of stipulating the definition of something, and we also sometimes stipulate some axioms. Axioms are just additional stipulated claims. 
we stipulate those things and then we run a proof or a kind of calculation. We think really hard and we calculate really precisely and we discover things like the fact that the interior angles of a triangle sum to 180 degrees. That's how we know mathematical and geometrical facts. We stipulated some facts, like we stipulate that a triangle is just going to be defined, even though there aren't any and we've never found any. We just stipulate that a triangle is just going to be a three-sided polygon, which is a two-dimensional figure. And then we stipulate some other axioms and then we just prove things. We just calculate, as it were, from those definitions. So some of these non-empirical questions can be answered by way of stipulation and proof. If the answer is yes, if the answer to a non-empirical question can be answered by just stipulating some definitions and then running some calculations from those definitions, then it's a mathematical or geometrical question. Right? So the questions about the number nine and triangles, they're in this category. But there are going to be some questions that can't be answered by this method either. Those are the philosophical questions. Okay, so that's my answer to the question, what is a philosophical question? The answer is, a philosophical question is one that can't be answered by way of observation or experimentation, nor can it be answered by way of proof or calculation from some stipulated definitions or axioms. That's a philosophical question. And philosophy is the project of rigorously attempting to answer those questions. So let's test this definition of philosophy against at least one of the examples of philosophical questions that we had earlier. What is the just way to arrange society? Notice, first of all, that this is a question not of description, it's not asking how is society arranged. It's not a question of prediction. It's not asking how will society be arranged. It's not a question of explanation. It's not asking why is society arranged the way it is. No, this is a question of justification. The question is what's the right way to arrange society? What's the fair way to arrange society? Once you realize that that's what the question is, it's rather obviously not empirical. It's not a question that you're going to answer by observing or experimenting. Say that you watch what societies do. That's never by itself going to tell you what they should do. It's just going to tell you what they do do. So it's not an empirical question. It's also not a sort of mathematical question that you can answer by just running some calculations with your calculator from some stipulated definitions. It's not like society is something that we posited into existence, like a triangle or the number nine. Society is a thing that's out there. So we can't just use our calculators to figure out what the just or fair way to arrange society is. So it's neither of those. It's a philosophical question. The only thing that we have to answer a question like that, I'll just sort of skip ahead and tell you, the only thing that we have is, well, rational or rigorous argument. Now, by argument, I mean something rather specific. I don't mean yelling and screaming at your family members. That's one way that we use the word argument. Two people are in an argument. That's not what I'm talking about. When I say argument, I mean a rational process that attempts to persuade someone of the truth of some claim, right? An argument is a series of, of logical steps that leads to a conclusion, and then that conclusion is supposed to be demonstrated rationally to be true by the argument. That's the only tool that philosophers have. They don't have observation or experimentation. They don't have calculators or proofs that they can use to answer the questions that they're interested in. The only thing they've got are arguments. All they have are words and clear thoughts. That's the only thing that they can use to try to answer these questions. 
And this fact, this fact that philosophers only have arguments, it's going to lead to two very important facts about philosophy. But we're going to get to those a little bit later. Before we get to them, let me just consider two sort of objections that you might have to the practice of philosophy based on the definition that I just gave. The first objection that one often hears to philosophy, academic philosophy understood in this way, is this. Anything goes. It seems like if we're not answering these questions with observation that anyone can engage in, anyone can look at the objects that we're trying to study or run some experiments, anyone can reproduce an experiment. If we're not answering these questions by observation or experimentation, and if we're not answering them by calculating or proving things from stipulated definitions and axioms, well, then anything goes. Anybody can just say anything and they're just as right as anyone else. That's the first objection. But anything doesn't go because there are things that philosophers use to answer philosophical questions. I just mentioned them. They're arguments. And some arguments are better than other arguments. Here's an example of an argument real quick. This is an argument, this is a famous old argument, against the existence of God, right? So St. Thomas Aquinas offered some arguments in favor of the existence of God. Here's an argument against the existence of God. The argument starts from the fact that evil exists in the world. Bad things exist. Hurricanes, typhoons, genocide, slavery. Take that fact. Also, define God as a creature that knows everything, can do anything, and wants to do all the best stuff, always. If that's what we mean by God, then it seems like God's existence is incompatible with the existence of bad things in the world. Because if God is good, then God doesn't want there to be bad things. And if God is all-knowing, then God knows where all the bad stuff is. And if God is all-powerful and knows where all the bad stuff is and wants there to be no bad stuff, then, well, God can just go and get rid of it. But since that bad stuff still exists, since evil still exists, there can't be a creature like that. There can't be an all-knowing, all-powerful, all-good creature. Okay, that's an argument. That's just an example. If you take a whole philosophy course, you're going to talk about arguments like that. Well, is that argument any good? Well, it's not, it's not bad. It's not, it's not a terrible argument. Some arguments are better than other arguments. So it's not true that anything goes. If you give good, rigorous, thoughtful arguments, and someone else responds, and then someone else responds to that, you're going to get closer to the truth, to true answers to those philosophical questions. Arguments are what allow philosophers to avoid the problem of, you know, anything goes. So here's the second objection to philosophy. The objection to the whole enterprise, an objection that just says you shouldn't be doing philosophy. The objection is philosophy doesn't produce anything. It doesn't make anything. It doesn't make telescopes. It doesn't make nuclear power plants. It doesn't make computers. It doesn't make anything. And because it doesn't produce anything, it's worthless. That's the objection. Well, philosophy does produce things. What it produces are reasoned, rational, well-supported answers to philosophical questions. That's what it produces. It produces reasoned answers to philosophical questions. So it's just not true that philosophy doesn't produce anything. And so then, when the question is whether philosophy is worthless, or not? Well, to answer that question, we just need to know whether these reasoned answers to philosophical questions are worth having, whether those are good things to have. Think about one of the questions that we haven't talked about, but that we put on the board earlier. The question is, do I have an immortal soul? Do I have a soul that continues to live on after my bodily death? 
is this question worth answering well? I suggest that it is. Think about it like this. Most people on the planet, most people alive, think that they and everyone they know is immortal. Immortal means that you can't die. And the sense of immortality that I'm talking about is the real sense that matters. Your body dies, everybody basically thinks that. Your body will cease to function and it will dissolve or disintegrate into the ground. Well, what happens to you? Does your mind, do your thoughts and consciousness live on? If you're religious, and most people on the planet are, then chances are you think that you have a soul. You have a consciousness or a mind that continues to live after your body dies. And in fact, that soul can't cease to exist. It lives on forever. All that it can ever do is move from one place to another. It moves from your body to either some very nice place or some less nice place. That's what most people think. Most people think that in the important, interesting sense, they and everyone they know is immortal. Are they right? Is it true? Do you have an immortal soul? Are you really and truly capable of dying, ceasing to exist, or will you live forever? That's the question. Do you want a good answer to that question? Do you want to know the right answer? A well-reasoned, well-supported answer to that question? I suggest that you do. You want to know that. That's what I think. And so if that's the case, if a reasoned answer to a question like this is valuable, and if those kinds of answers are the thing that philosophy produces, then philosophy is not at all worthless. Oh. Notice something, by the way. Notice that this question, the question of whether or not philosophy is worthwhile, whether it's worth doing, whether it's good to do, that's also a philosophical question, right? You can't answer that question with observation or experimentation. Whether something is worth doing is not a question that you answer by experiments, nor is it a question that you answer by just doing some calculations with your calculator or with a notebook from some stipulated definitions or axioms. So the question of whether philosophy is worth doing is a philosophical question. Oh, and actually, uh, think back to the last objection to philosophy, the objection that anything goes. That question, the question of whether any answer to a philosophical question is as good as any other answer, that's also a philosophical question, right? Whether anything goes is not something that you can figure out by observing or experimenting, nor is it something that you can figure out by running some proofs or calculations from stipulated definitions or axioms. So that's also a philosophical question. Okay. Okay. So you remember just like a couple minutes ago, I said that the only tool that philosophers have to answer philosophical questions is thinking and argumentation. Arguments are all that philosophers have. And I said that this fact about philosophy is going to have two, at least two, significant consequences. Here's one of those consequences. The answers to philosophical questions are very often controversial. That is, it's hard to get folks to agree. Even if some arguments are better than other arguments, we don't have observation or experimentation to appeal to. We don't have calculations or proofs from stipulated definitions to appeal to. So there's a lot of persistent disagreement. And that actually explains the fact that this definition of what philosophy is, is controversial. What I've said here, the fact that philosophy is the rigorous pursuit of the answers to questions that are neither empirical nor mathematical. That claim is controversial. Not all philosophers agree with me about that. And the definition of philosophy that I'm giving here predicts that fact. Because it predicts that this question, what is philosophy, is also itself a philosophical question and will therefore be controversial. The question, what is philosophy? Is it something that at least straightforwardly can be answered by experiments or observation? You might think not. 
Is it something that can be answered with a calculator? No. If that's the case, then the question, what is philosophy, is itself a philosophical question. So it turns out we've been doing philosophy this whole time. OK, and here's the second consequence of the fact that philosophy can only really be done by way of argument, by way of rational argument. Philosophy is hard. It's hard to do because you can't fall back on running experiments or observing things. And you can't fall back on using your calculator or a notepad to run some proofs or calculations from stipulated definitions or axioms. The only thing you've got to try to answer these very difficult to answer questions is clear, rational thought and the, the good, rigorous use of argument. If that's the only tool that you have, then philosophy is going to be hard. And if you practice doing those things, arguing and thinking clearly over and over again for a long period of time, you're going to get very, very good at it. It's like this. Say that you want to make some iced tea. Uh, and you have like some powdered iced tea mix or something, instant iced tea mix. You pour the mix in and you pour the water in and you mix them up and you get your iced tea. If a chemist wants to make a new solution, a compound or something like that, they will do similar sorts of things. They'll use tools similar to the tools that you use when you're making iced tea. They'll use like some glass containers and like some kind of mixing utensil. They'll use tools like that. They'll just use much more sophisticated ones and they'll use them much, much more carefully. They will measure the ingredients much more precisely than you will. And if you're a chemist and you use these tools over and over again, you'll get very good at using them. That's sort of like what philosophers are doing. Philosophers are using tools that you use in your ordinary life. They're using words and arguments. They're making claims and counterclaims. Those are things that you do in your everyday life, except for you do them in a sort of casual way, the way that you make iced tea in a sort of casual way. Philosophers are using similar tools or the same tools sometimes in a much more rigorous, much more precise way, the way that a chemist is using glass containers and beakers and pipettes. And Philosophers, therefore, become very, very good at using those tools because that's all they have and they use them over and over again. They get very, very good at making arguments and analyzing arguments and making very precise, very clear claims. And it's because philosophers have so much practice using the tools of rational thought and argument that philosophers end up being so smart or, if not smart, really good at standardized tests. Okay, this is the part of the video that is aimed in large part at the parents. Let's talk first about the GMAT. That's the standardized test, it's like the SATs, that you have to take if you want to go to business school, if you want to get like an MBA. This test tests all sorts of things, certain mathematical skills, certain reading skills. Here are the scores of students who take this business school exam based on their undergraduate majors. Okay, so philosophy is doing pretty well. I mean, it loses out to mathematics and physics, but it's pretty high up on that list. This maybe is partly due to the fact that philosophers have to learn to think really well because all they have are arguments and they're trying to answer very, very difficult questions. Now let's talk about the LSAT. That's the law school entrance exam. For law school admissions, this standardized test is a huge part. Maybe it's the biggest, most important part or the second biggest, second most important part of law school admissions. Now we know that philosophers are gonna have an advantage when it comes to this test. It's a test that is trying to get at your ability to evaluate, assess, identify arguments. That's the biggest part of it because that's what lawyers do. They argue in the courtroom, in, in briefs and memos. 
They present arguments for certain claims. Philosophers are doing that all the time. And that's why philosophers do really well on this standardized test. There we go. Philosophers doing the best on the LSAT. Then there's the GRE. The GRE, I think it stands for the Graduate Requisite Exam, is the sort of generic graduate school exam. You go to college, and then you want to go to graduate school, but you don't want to go to business school or law school specifically. You want to go to graduate school in history or English or biology or chemistry or physics or mathematics or any of those sort of standard um, arts and sciences subjects, you have to take the GRE. The GRE has three components or three parts. All right, the first part is the verbal part. All right, let's see how everybody does on the verbal part. Oh, that's pretty good, right? You would think that English majors would be high up, and they are, right? Because English majors, well, they read things a lot, and they get very good at reading texts, so they're going to do well on the verbal portion. But philosophers do better, so that's nice. That's good. Okay, then there's another portion. There's a writing portion. Let's see how philosophers do on the writing portion. Oh, also doing good. Okay, pretty good. This, by the way, is partly due to the fact that philosophical writing is just very, very precise, very, very careful. And if you do something very, very carefully over and over again, you get very good at it. The third component of the GRE is the quantitative section. Right? This is basically a math test, like the math sections of the SAT, except for you have to take this one before going to graduate school. Now, philosophy is not going to dominate the quantitative section because it's basically a math test. And philosophers don't practice doing math all the time. Right? So the results look like this. Okay, so philosophers aren't at the top, but all of the subjects that beat philosophy on the quantitative portion are basically different versions of mathematical or quantitative studies, right? Math is up there, physics is up there, right? Philosophy falls somewhere in the middle, but it falls above all of the other subjects in the humanities, all of the other subjects also in the social sciences. Philosophers do better than historians or English majors, even on the math part of the test. Okay, so what if you then take all three of the sections and you calculate the average scores on each section and then you weight all of these sections, these three sections equally? You'll get a certain kind of composite score, weighing the writing section just as much as the verbal and just as much as the quantitative. This is what the results look like for the composite GRE scores. Whoa, that's pretty good. I mean, look at the distance between philosophy, which is first, and the next best subject. That's a big difference. Okay, I'm feeling pretty good about my career choice at the moment. Although, one of the problems with my career choice, because I'm a college professor of philosophy, is that I don't think I'm going to make as much money as I would make if I had just majored in philosophy as an undergraduate and then gone into some other field. Okay, so here are some of the facts about how philosophy majors do in their career salaries. Now, this chart and this graph only compare philosophy majors to those who major in other subjects that are outside of science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and that sort of stuff. But we're doing pretty well. Like if you look at all the, the salary numbers in this chart, right? The philosophy numbers are higher than the numbers for those other subjects. See, I told you we were good at math. Okay, so this finally brings us to the following question. This is the final question. Is that why one should study philosophy. Should one study philosophy 
to become rich, to become smart, are those good reasons to pick a college major in philosophy? Notice something about this question. This is not a question that you can answer by observing or doing experiments, because this is a question about not what happens, but what should happen and why one should do it. So it's not an empirical question. It's also not a mathematical type question that can be answered by running some calculations or proofs from stipulated definitions or axioms. So this question of why one should study philosophy, if at all, is also a philosophical question. Let's just make sure I have a good marker now. A good marker now. A good marker now. Yeah. Don't include this in the video. Ba -da -da -da. Ba -da -da -da. 